Uh, thank you to everybody for attending our TravelWise webinar, Travel Connectivity, Challenges, Solutions, and Path to Success, brought to you by Telrad. Um, we'd love to hear where you're from and uh, where, you, um, where you're located at, where you're working. If you want to put that in the chat, that'd be great. Uh, presenters today, we have four of them, which is pretty exciting. Um, Patrick is the General Counsel and COO at STS and Atlink. Micah White is a Manager of Planning and Grants and planning and grants from the Muskogee Creek Nation. Um, Alex is the VP of Sales from Telrad Network and Sam Curtis, the president of Atlink. Just a reminder, this session is recorded, so we'll be able to share that link out to everybody who has registered for the webinar, um, usually by tomorrow afternoon, so look for that in your email. A couple of learning objectives for you to keep in mind while we're going through our webinar today. Um, the two takeaways you should be um, looking for is how to bridge the digital divide and working alongside communities to share knowledge and maximize successful deployments. If you have questions during the webinar, please, please be sure to drop them in the chat and we will address them as they come up. Um, and just a little snippet here for you to take a look at some of our upcoming webinars. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Patrick, to get things rolling. All right, thank you. Let me uh, get my screen shared here. <clears throat> and there we are. All right, well, welcome everyone. <clears throat> I'm delighted to uh, present to you today, and I want to thank Telrad and Tribal Hub for inviting me to present to you. Um, as mentioned, I am General Counsel and Chief Operating Officer of AppLink Services. Uh, that is an internet service provider, and it also has an affiliate, Specialty Telecommunication Services, which is an engineering firm, and together um, they do a lot of work for themselves and for a lot of other companies that are either in the broadband business or wanting to get in the broadband business. Um, what we'd like to talk about today, let me see if I'm advancing my slide properly. Okay, and... There we are. So there are really five topics that I want to discuss today. And um, I should say that uh, as AtLink and STS began reaching out to Native America here in the state of Oklahoma, and we have plenty of tribes, as many of you know, uh, we were really just trying to help them exercise their rights under what was called the tribal priority window back in uh, 2019, where they could claim a very valuable licensed frequency known as the education broadband service spectrum, one that was reserved to schools, but is really wasn't used a lot. And we wanted to make sure they understood how to make that election and use it. And, and our objective was maybe to license uh, the frequency and, and use it. But as that progressed, and as suddenly the pandemic hit, and we were all having to live our lives through the internet, uh, suddenly money was being made available to governments and a lot of tribal governments that we'll talk about some in more detail today. But uh, we realized, my heavens, they, they all want to get in the broadband business and expand access in their tribal areas, but they need industry partners, and we are certainly that. In that process, we learned that learning basic broadband terms was important. We'll use some of those today. So we'll go over those so we're all on the same page. The second thing I'd like to just discuss very briefly is why it has been so hard to find good broadband in tribal America and, frankly, in rural America generally. And then, of course, what's the government doing about it? And the answer, of course, is a lot, which we will discuss. And then how can a tribal nation apply and participate in these wonderful programs? There are a number of them. We'll stress three today. And then finally, where can you find knowledgeable help? And uh, so we have experience there. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to be calling on Micah White uh, throughout this presentation because he is on the other side of the fence. He represents the Muscogee Creek Nation. He's a project manager and he's worked with grant applications in other areas, but he will give you really his view, his perspective of what it was like uh, to be approached uh, by companies like AtLink, how they finally made a decision, what sort of expertise they were looking for to uh, help them in the process, and really just give you uh, the benefit of his experience, which is broad. And we've come to be uh, good business friends because of all of this. So broadband terms, well, what is it? That came up quite frequently. Well, broadband is a very broad uh, term that really refers to any kind of high-speed data communication over the internet and using a variety of radio frequencies. Believe it or not, there are even some radio frequencies used in optical fiber, although a lot of that is laser, but um, it, it, is, uh, it is data communication at high speeds over the web. So 
what what is what does it mean? How do we measure broadband? Because we've heard a lot of numbers thrown around. Well, we really measure it in three ways. What is the download speed? What is the upload speed? And what is the signal latency? And of course, download means uh, when you're pulling information from the internet. When you go to a web page and the web page loads on your screen, uh, that's a download. And we measure that in uh, the amount of data that comes into your home or business per second. Upload, of course, is when you send information, like when you made the request, or if you're on a Zoom call, and like I am speaking, well, I'm uploading information right now to the web. We also made it measure that in uh, the amount of data per second. And finally, we worry about signal latency. While all of these uh, uh, bits of data move around at almost the speed of light, of course, uh, we want to measure round trip time. That is when you send a request, it goes to a website, comes back. What is that round trip? And uh, that signal latency, and that needs to be very, very low. Even though it moves at the speed of light, we have become very impatient as internet users, as you will see. And of course, data is measured in kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes per second, even beyond that. But megabytes and gigabytes per second are really how we measure things today. And then finally, <clears throat> When we refer to the numbers, the first number you'll see is the download speed. Let's say it's 100 megabytes per second. There will be a, a, a slash, and then you have the upload speed. Let's say that's 20 megabytes per second. And then the signal lat latency normally is last. I really won't have to refer to signal lat latency much because as this next thing, next slide shows, uh, Anything that is more than average a tenth of a second, that is a round trip from when you send a request and it comes back to you. Anything more than about a tenth of a second and we get impatient. So uh, believe it or not, that's, uh, that's how we've all come to expect the internet to move quickly for us. But of course, these, the, what we really talk about when you talk about speeds are the minimum satisfactory broadband speeds. And those have changed dramatically since the pandemic hit and we realized just how dependent we were on the internet uh, suddenly and how many areas, mostly rural and a lot of tribal areas, did not have even the minimum broadband, broadband speeds available if they had any broadband at all. And so as I run down how quickly it changed, in 2018, we were talking about a minimum speed of 10 megabits down, one megabit up. 2019, that became the 25 and three. And by last year, it suddenly was 100 megabits down, 20 up. That's very fast by standards, but that's becoming a minimum. And one of the programs, the ARPA program, which we'll talk about, they want now symmetry. They want 100 megabits down and 100 megabits up. And so how do we kind of put that into perspective? This next slide will kind of talk about that. <clears throat> so let's, let's talk about what these speeds mean for a user. If you're just doing email, uh, text email, it really doesn't take much. As you can see, about one megabit per second, and even less than that will, will satisfy email needs. But once you start browsing, you ought to have more, and you can see the minimum recommended there, anything from about three megabits per second uh, to as much as 10. If you're getting on Facebook a lot, other social media where you start to interact more, you probably want between three and 10. And then when you start doing Zooms, well, it goes up pretty fast. You got to have at least three, and then you ought to have as much as 20. Uh, to where you could have a uh, host, not just a simple video call or a Zoom call, but one like today, where we have a number of attendees, you know, tens, sometimes in the hundreds, then you need a lot more data speed coming through. If you're using this, uh, here's you see the HD streaming. If you're talking about Hulu or Sling or the Apple TV, where you're getting your entertainment uh, from the web, suddenly it goes up, the demand increases even more. If you're a gamer, uh, you can do it if the game isn't, shall we say, terribly interactive. You can get by with a little bit, but most gamers want very fast connection, very fast speeds, and then suddenly it's leaping to 35 megabits per second and beyond. A lot of them want a gig and nothing less. And then, of course, what I talk the last entry, which is 4K streaming, that's really where the devices like the new televisions, even 8K are coming out now, where the data demand, what they can accommodate is so high, you're going to have to have a really big pipe coming into your home or business to accommodate it. And as you'll see at the right side of that screen, I'm talking, what's our wild card? Well, we now have multiple people using the web at the same time in our homes and businesses. The kids are on the phone. You may have your uh, two or more TVs working at the same time. Uh, people are trying to cut, conduct business in their home office. 
So all of this simultaneous use just begins to stack all of these recommended requirements. You get up into big speeds very, very quickly. So that's really kind of the context. I hope that gives you some idea why these speeds are important and how, frankly, you're using them probably every day at your home or your business. <clears throat> the last uh, kind of basic thing I want to talk about is how we deliver broadband. And there are a number of ways. Everyone's heard about optical fiber and many programs that's considered to be the Rolls Royce, the absolute pinnacle of what you should do. And of course, it is marvelous. You can, uh, uh, in most cases, you can, you can even uh, accommodate up to 10 gigabytes of data coming through, uh, gigabytes per, per second coming through an optical fiber. And the range is, well, it's, it's only limited by where you have the fiber. The real challenge, of course, is it's very expensive. Um, uh, the numbers are staggering, actually. When uh, If you're going to bury fiber to get places, it's upwards to $60,000 a mile, and that's if the digging's easy. Uh, and of course, now as people are trying to put fiber everywhere, you have supply issues, and the build time tends to be long. The next popular and very popular way, and the way that we at Atlink and what Telrad is helping us do, is the fixed wireless. What do I mean by fixed? Well, we provide service to a fixed address. And so it's really as compared to or distinguished from mobile service like your phones when you're traveling. In this case, we provide broadband to a fixed address using much of the same technology. The popular ways now, of course, are 4G LTE, LTE being long-term evolution. It's just sort of an industry term. And the G in that case refers to generation. It's just um, as technology has improved and the carrying capacity of uh, uh, this technology has increased, uh, a new generation comes along. So the latest is 5G, but let's talk about it briefly. What I like about both of those is they tend to uh, deploy rather quickly as compared to fiber, they're much more lower cost um, to get uh, a, an infrastructure in place, um, but they are dependent on a few things. So if you have a 4G LTE operating, you can go up to about 300 megabits per second uh, which is very good, but you have to be within about 10 miles of a tower and you need to have line of sight. So you don't need, a, you need to avoid a lot of trees in between you and that tower. Uh, you don't need hills and that sort of thing. There's some new technology that might help overcome some of that, um, but it's not deployed very much yet. And you've heard probably a lot about fixed wireless and the 5G LTE. In fact, it was in the news this morning because uh, the airlines are afraid that the 5G service that AT&T and T-Mobile and Verizon are putting in various places is going to interfere with the uh, aircraft to ground radar uh, near airports. And uh, truly, the FCC and the uh, airlines are up in arms about it going live today. We'll see what happens. But it is a very good means of uh, providing Internet. And it can go up to like fiber. It can match fiber. Its great limitation, though, is its distance from a tower. You've got to be within 1,000 feet, uh, and it better be perfect line of sight. It's rather new technology. So it really isn't suitable for rural areas because you don't have the dense population, uh, and, uh, and you'd have to put too many towers up uh, to, to get service, although some people are, are promoting it. Um, we, we at Atlink don't see it as a real solution, except in areas where you have a little more density of population. Um, very quickly, then, of course, you have traditional satellite. Most people are considering that really not helpful when it comes to speeds. Those satellites travel at about 22,000 miles above the Earth, <clears throat> moving at about 7,000 miles per hour, and uh, they just can't accommodate a lot of fast speeds, and there's a lot of signal latency just because of that distance. Even traveling at the speed of light, it ends up taking uh, a few seconds for things to respond in most cases. The new big entrant, of course, into satellites is Starlink, Elon Musk's company, and that has, is dealing with low Earth orbit satellites. Satellites uh, in between 70 and 100 miles, you know, at a fraction of what normal satellites are, and that can reach speeds up to 100 megabits per second. We've been measuring it. Um, what we have found it, they're, they're doing pretty well on those, but uh, a lot of signal loss. So you, you have breaks in your internet signal. You've got to reload a page or start your work over. So they have some kinks to work out. They're putting up more satellites, but uh, uh, that's a new entrant. The final two, and I'll go very quickly, are coax cable. That's still a lot. And the DSL lines that telephone companies have. I'm calling those obsolete because no one's going to, no one that we know of is going to try to 
um, deploy that anywhere. Uh, it's just a, uh, those are technologies that have been surpassed. They do a pretty good job, Co uh, coax cable does, but you wouldn't put any new stuff in. You'd go with optical fiber if you had it for that reason. Let me stop there and see if there are any questions that somebody would like me to answer before we go into the next topic. I haven't seen any questions pop up yet, Pat. Okay, well, I'll continue that. Well, let's get on then. Why, why are we having this, uh, this digital divide? Well, we know, first of all, <clears throat> not much money has reached the tribes. Historically, less than 1% of the broadband funds reach tribal lands, and there's no broadband infrastructure in many of the tribal areas. People are having to use mobile phones as the only internet tool, so they cannot do remote learning. They can't do anything that uh, uh, people in the, in the cities and suburbs can do. Um, uh, and of course, being rural areas, it's very expensive to lay fiber. It's expensive for us to put up towers uh, because we don't see a lot of business uh, there. And uh, so it's hard to sustain a for-profit business in the rural areas. And then finally, and this is true even today, these federal grant programs are complex. They're very demanding. There's a lot of paperwork, not just to get the application in, but to comply with the programs after you get the money and you're building out. Unfortunately, that complexity and burdensomeness remains, but there's help as we'll discuss. So the result, of course, is there's no internet worthy of the name in many tribal areas or rural areas. It's just not gone. But I'm going to refer in the next one to Bob Dylan, one of my favorites, of course, whose real name is Robert Allen Zimmerman. Uh, Sam Curtis said he did not know that, I think, one of my colleagues until, uh, until yesterday as he was reviewing this. And of course, he's smoking, so I have a uh, public service message there. But times are changing in Native America's favor. So let's talk about that. There are, there are a number of federal programs that want to get broadband to Native America, and they have a number of obje objectives. And I have this kind of wheel of objectives, but all of these things that are surrounding that high-speed broadband access wheel are the objectives of what these programs want you to address. So if you are a, a Native American tribe and you intend to apply for broadband funds, your application will want to address each of these areas to show how broadband service, that is high-speed service worthy of the name, will help your schools, will help your community centers, will help housing projects, will help home entertainment, remote learning, for example, uh, and make it affordable, make it accessible. Programs to promote digital literacy. All of the things that the government wants to see, you will address in an application and you will see there they span the the uh, spectrum of things that you can do with broadband now i'm not going to go into any detail here but i want you to just see how many broadband programs or how many agencies of the federal government are involved i just show what i guess uh, 12 here they each have some sort of uh, program for you uh, and uh, you can go to their websites and they'll have a uh, they'll have a notice a public notice that shows you the rules and regs, but they span everything from agriculture to education, to libraries, to labor, that is work programs, all of these things are there. We won't go into any but a couple of three that are very popular now, but I just wanted you to know there are so many out there for you to use. So what are the big programs available today? And uh, the first one is the one that came out uh, late, uh, I guess, 2019, and then early last year, and that's the NTIA program, NTIA being the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. All three of these programs are very similar in their objectives. They want tribal lands to have broadband access to everything from education to medicine, uh, telehealth, all of the things that you would hope, and that wheel that I had in the prior slide talked about. And in each case, um, there's one that the USDA has, that they call their Reconnect program. And then the Treasury Department, of course, has the ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act funds. And in each case, if you're a tribal government or a tribal uh, school or a tribal agency or a tribal corporation, you, you should qualify as an eligible applicant. So that makes it easy. And what are the eligible areas? Well, first of all, it's got to be a place that doesn't have this uh, high-speed internet available. And right now, the, uh, uh, it's, it's pretty low. Um, uh, for example, under the NTI program, all you had to show was uh, uh, the areas where you want to put broadband really didn't have 25 and 3 service available everywhere. 
Uh, if you could find at least one location that didn't have it, uh, you could build a plan around that <clears throat> and the other locations. Um, and if you were going to take the money, you had to commit, of course, to uh, uh, build at least 25 and three service everywhere. That very low speed has been surpassed very, very quickly. But I do want to talk about that because round one had almost a billion dollars available for that NTIA program. And that filing deadline was last September. So that that's already passed. But um, the November legislation that came out of Washington added another $2 billion to this plan. Now, you've got to submit a, sep a supplemental application or a first application. They have not set a deadline for that, but we're expecting it in the spring. And the max grant, again, is going to be $50 million, up to $50 million of grant money for a broadband. The cool thing about all of these programs is no match is required. What do I mean? Many of the programs historically have required an applicant to be prepared to put up uh, matching funds, matching dollars, up to 25, in some cases, 50% of what you're asking the government to, uh, to uh, give you in terms of a grant. None of these programs require the tribe to provide a match. Now, there are some variations of the program where a tribe can ask for a grant that's a little larger in size and to offer a match. So you, you can offer a match and perhaps get more, but uh, uh, you don't have to, to be part of the program. The other two programs you can see from this table, you've got to be prepared to put in a uh, very high service, 100 and 100. Remember we talked about symmetry now, download and upload speeds need to be identical. Uh, so both of the, the newer programs, the USDA program and the ARPA program that the government has under the treasury, a lot of money available, 350 million under the reconnect, and that's just really this year. Um, you've got to have a filing deadline now of near the end of February, the 22nd of next month to get a reconnect application in. And you can get up to 25 million in certain cases, 35 million for a broadband program in uh, into a tribal area. And of course the treasury, very similar program. You've got to be permit, you've got to be prepared to, to build a 100, 100 network. There is a small uh, exception for a 120 network, but $10 billion is available there. Some of that money, the ARPA money has already gone out to tribal areas for other projects, uh, everything from sewer and water projects and road projects, but 10 billion has been earmarked just for broadband. And that application is due the 1st of June. Right now, I haven't been able to find a maximum amount of grant that they will, they will uh, authorize, but uh, uh, we'll be looking for one. If one comes up, we'll, we'll update that. But those are the three big programs that if you're a tribe and you want broadband, you'll want to participate in, if at all possible. So what are the primary components of any broadband application? I'd like to go through this slide, and then I'd like to ask Micah to comment about his experience in this area. There are about 15 things that go into it. I don't have to read all of them for you, but when you get to the application, you're going to have to, of course, know the deadline, but you have to show that you're eligible. You have to show that you found uh, unserved areas. You've got to map those. You've got to show them where on the planet they are uh, and defend it. You've got to show what your broadband network is going to be technically. What are the specs of the equipment? Uh, what kind of service will it give? You're going to have to have budget projections. What, it'll what will it cost to build? How long will it take? When will you have it complete? Then you have to show uh, financial projections to show that you'll be able to sustain this, that you'll generate enough money from customers that it will sustain the network that you've built. And of course, your obligation to run that network is going to be for the useful life of the infrastructure. That could be a decade or two. So uh, they'll want to see that you, that you can do it. They'll want to know what sort of operational experience you have. And if you're a tribe and you have none, then you need an industry partner like an AtLink in your area to help you operate that. Those are just a few of the things that are that you're going to have to address in addition to all of the ways that your tribe will use this new broadband access to benefit the tribe and its members. Remember that wheel that I showed in the earlier, in the earlier slide. Mike, if you would comment for a moment, would you talk about just what it was like for the Muscogee Creek Nation to identify a broadband need and how you went about just trying to wrap your arms around these application requirements? Absolutely, Pat. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. The, you know, the, the approach that we had at Muscogee Creek Nation was kind of, it was a matter of identifying our needs from the very beginning uh, in an accurate way, because 
at this point in time, there's a lot of adaptations and a lot of investment being made into broadband. And so um, what we kind of ran into is that there were different providers that were crisscrossing our areas, but um, in many times we were not aware or uh, it would only go so far and not serve our entire needs. And so uh, as this came out, we had to really think through, okay, well, what, what role do we want to play to uh, get the benefits that we need out of this investment? And so, um, you know, that required us to kind of be realistic about what our capacity was to serve, as Pat was mentioned, uh, internet service and broadband technologies to all of these areas. Um, but at the very least, had we not have had somebody like an industry partner like Atlink and STS to help us, I really don't know that we would have been able to get this completed because of the technical complexities of it all. Um, we had to sit down, we really looked at, you know, what do we currently use? Where do we need our broadband access to be? And where are our citizens uh, hurting the most? And we took all three of those criteria into play whenever we were considering that. So uh, it's it's been a fluid experience for us because as time goes by, as we find out more information and more rounds of funding, we kind of add to the overall broadband plan. So, um, you know, my suggestion on that would be is to, to start there with a, a broader plan that you can pare down into phases based on the funding that you receive and the most important accomplishments that you need out of that. So is there anything else you want me to talk about there, Pat? No, I think that covers uh, this slide and just sort of how you started the process, because it is daunting. Remember, I talked about burdensomeness and complexity. Well, there are 15 examples of just what that application requires of you. The next slide I want to talk about really, then who are the stakeholders? Let's suppose that you are uh, a tribe that has decided we're going to build a broadband network. Now, we've never done it before, but what does that mean? What's involved? Who, who are the, what's the type of skill set or organizations that we need to include or consult with in order to do it? So I picked out nine kind of big ones that make sense to me when you're going to build a broadband network. First, you need some assistance with grant writing. And, uh, and compliance after you've built it. You better find fiber contractors, people that know how to bury the fiber and get it to the neighborhoods that you wanna serve or um, those that will put it uh, aerially on utility poles. You can actually string it like they do electrical service wires. And there you will contact a utility and, and someone that knows how to string all of that. You need, if you're going to do some fixed wireless service like what uh, Atlink does, you need to know who builds towers, how quickly it takes, how much it costs, uh, and uh, and how and how fast, of course, they can go up and where. Then you need to understand. Uh, well, um, okay, now we're on the internet, but how do how do we get our network to the internet? You'll learn about things like fiber transit providers and middle mile providers, those that provide, shall we say, the big extension cords that get you to the massive internet nodes in places like Oklahoma City, Dallas, Houston, New York, and so on, that get you out to the rest of the world. Um, who will provide equipment. Remember, we've got to have this, these things on towers or in the fiber network. We have to have routers at people's homes. We all have Wi-Fi routers or internet routers at our homes and businesses. Well, somebody makes those. Telrad, of course, is our uh, equipment provider of choice, but you have to find people that understand that and have relationships there. Then you need somebody like an Atlink. Uh, do you know how to run uh, a, an operation? How do you provide service on a daily basis? I have a slide that talks about that more. And then you need people that know how to climb towers and install the equipment. You need somebody that can train your people if necessary, or even provide what's called a turnkey operation. We'll build it, we'll get it started operating, we'll teach you how to do it, and then, uh, and then you can take it over. I know Native American, a lot of the casino applications hired some of the bigger companies out of Vegas and New Jersey and Atlantic City to, to uh, help get casino started. And then of course they learned how to do it on their own uh, with their members, perhaps with just some consultation thereafter. That would be kind of a turnkey arrangement. It takes a few years, but, but there's people that know how to do that. And then finally, and Mike, I'd like you to talk about this. The applications uh, also want you to consider teaming up with communities and counties and other rural areas that are also trying to build a broadband network. Often, if you can combine resources and tie into each other's networks, you can save costs and avoid duplication. Micah, would you talk about how you helped us there quite recently to get uh, some county representatives to a meeting? Absolutely. So 
You know, when we were looking at what the needs were for broadband within our reservation, um, we really try to take into account all the ways in which broadband is used and affects our lives. And in many ways, that uh, is a lot broader in context than what any of us probably would even realize at first glance. Um, so after visiting internally here, we did realize that there were some uh, communications issues with our police department and there were some other operational issues related to communications that uh, other stakeholders within our reservation were experiencing. And so uh, given that so much of the money that has come out in the last year or two, at least during the pandemic, has been so focused on broadband, we looked at ways that uh, we could provide a benefit to our county commissioners and their operations in the cities and different areas of that nature um, to stretch our dollars further and get more out of the value of the opportunity that we have at the moment. Um, the fortunate thing about that is whenever you have this sort of money and you're building this sort of infrastructure, uh, owning the infrastructure makes a big deal whenever you are trying to figure out how to work this out with others. And so it's, it's a valuable piece to bring to the table. And uh, when you can honestly examine what the benefits will be both to you and any other stakeholders, both internal to the tribe and external as well, uh, it, it's not hard to see the benefit of how this will overlap and how stretching your dollar will bring value to everybody. So we actually reached out to all the county commissioners in our reservation and asked if they had any interest in helping us with expanding the communications infrastructure here in our reservation. And um, that turned out to have great interest. Uh, much of the money that they had received through the ARPA uh, Act actually had earmarked for broadband and it pretty well limited the counties here in Oklahoma. Um, with what they could do. And so with public safety and broadband both being something that was eligible for that, uh, we had a very constructive conversation with almost every single county within our reservation about how we could combine our dollars to make sure that as we build out our broadband network, we're also supporting the emergency communications in a lot of these more rural areas where there may not be good cell phone coverage or more communications coverage in general. And so that's kind of where we've been with that right now as we're preparing to go into the second round of applications is how do we incorporate these other aspects beyond just a broadband internet service into our build for the backbone and delivery of these services. So. Thank you, Mike. That's just perfect. You know, it, it was instructive that so, so much of their government needs for internet uh, was brought to the fore. Like you say, the emergency communications and law enforcement uh, communications. And of course, we had a reciprocal in, interest in that we can use their any high structure like their water towers, their tall buildings, their downtown areas, uh, we can put equipment on them rather than to have to build an expensive tower. So there's a lot of interest where we could each benefit from the other's assets. And of course, finally, they needed it for their schools and communities because they're trying to keep young people in their rural communities and, and uh, somehow give them the benefits of, of uh, uh, modern living without having to deal with the traffic, shall we say. Anyway, a very good thing. Finally, what's involved in running an internet company? So at some point you will have built it. You have a wonderful new broadband infrastructure and network. Now, what do you do with it? That was a question that came up a lot with the, with the Native American tribes we visited with. They said, geez, what can you do to help us actually run it? We've never done it. What does that involve? And we would say, well, we do soup to nuts. And then of course they said, what the heck is soup to nuts? Well, I broke it down into about 15 things that you can read, but you have to be able to generate sales of internet, people on phones, you have to support customers, you have to maintain and install equipment on towers, you've got to know what your supply chain is, do you have all of the customer equipment that you're going to put in somebody's home or business in your warehouse, do you have a marketing team, uh, do you have people that can bill and collect. There are these new subsidies for internet service, such as we used to call it the uh, uh, broadband benefit program, the el eligible broadband benefit. And now we're going to call it the, the affordable connectivity program. But for, for Native America, that's up to $75 a month per home. Uh, that can cover most all of an internet charge, if not all of it for most services. So very important for tribal America to, to have those, those things. Uh, and then of course you have you have to have uh, people that understand licensing of frequencies, um, the permits for uh, where you're going to put a tower, people that understand environmental compliance, uh, and so forth. So it, there, there are a lot of things that go into running a business, 
uh, some of which are unique uh, to in internet service providing, and perhaps a lot of it, uh, a lot of software that's unique, but somebody that knows how to run it day to day and support customers, install them and support them. Uh, and that's where the, an, an industry partner comes in uh, for some that's never doing it. So how do you pick them? So let's suppose you're a tribe and you're saying, okay, we're in, we're going to apply. We're going to get grant money for all of this. And we're going to be, bring high-speed broadband access to our members and any non-member that will pay us too. Remember, we've got to show sustainability of what you're going to build. So as many customers you can get, members and non-members alike, you will want. So how do you pick an industry partner? Well, here's what we suggest you ask them to provide. We want them to give you six simple slides. You can expand it beyond that, but first of all, we want to know who you are as an internet service provider, um, how big you are, how long you've been in business, what your key strengths are, what you know how to do. For example, do you have a lot of grant experience uh, with programs such as these? AppLink does. We participate in a number of these programs. The only difference being the numbers that are now available at tribes are astronomically higher. Uh, they're wonderful, but uh, we, 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 of course, had a lot of in, uh, uh, experience to bring to bear on the process. Finally, you want to know where they serve. I have a picture of a map of Texas. I, I hope uh, uh, no one takes offense. It's just a big state with a lot of internet, but you'll want to know where they serve in relation to where your tribal area is. Are they a good partner because they're geographically located near you. Finally, let them explain what kind of services they are. How do they deliver it? Uh, how do they support the customers? What speeds can they do? I'd want to know their pricing. Is this going to be affordable for our members? Do you know how to bring your prices in to a, into a market where they will be competitive prices? Somewhat difficult, of course, uh, if uh, it's an area that doesn't have good access, but the government programs force you to do affordability. So the question here becomes, can this company do it? Do they have a history of providing affordable service? And then you want to look, make sure they have good reviews. Every one of those customers, or pardon me, every one of those uh, internet service providers that you may consider as an industry partner ought to have nice reviews. And it better be above four points, you know, or four stars, somewhere between four and five stars, or you should keep looking. And then finally, they ought to tell you how to contact them if uh, you want more. Now, you can ask for a lot more information, but I thought I would say if you cover these six basic areas, you're going to learn a lot in that first meeting. And that's how you start evaluating who would be a good industry partner for our tribe. So what I then wanted to break down, and I'm getting close to the end here so we can have some questions. And Mike, I want you to comment on it. We tried to break down industry partner let's say, areas of consultation to three basic areas. The first one is the grant application assistance. What does that mean? Well, I think I, where we heard a lot is we need help with the technical design, the engineering design. We need help mapping those areas that are eligible for the service. They're called PFSAs in this grant jargon. That's a proposed funding service area. Don't need to commit that to memory, but it's an eligible area for the service. That is, it doesn't have good broadband access today. And here's the map of those areas. People that can help you um, build budgets, that can help with financial projections. That's all got to be part of your application. Uh, and then uh, finally, just general writing, assist, writing assistance. Uh, you'll want to go into the history of your tribe. You'll want to go into how it's going to benefit all of your housing projects, community centers, your schools, your hospitals. Um, there are ways to address that and show how broadband access is going to help those. You may know exactly or fundamentally how it's going to help, but it helps to have someone who's written, these, uh, written this language before because there is a sameness. So that's one area that can help you, a grant application assistance. A second area is building the construction. Well, some companies are just great at building towers, uh, uh, managing big projects. So you, they can serve as a general contractor. They can serve as a supervisor of subcontractors. You want to make sure, of course, you have, they have insurance and they're bonded. They have proper engineering degrees. Um, they have an ability to report on construction progress. Uh, all of this, of course, has to be reported back to the funding agency. So you want somebody that knows how to put it into a communicable form. They can document it. They can put it on spreadsheets. They can put it on the web so that you can send it electronically to these granting agencies. And of course, you want somebody that has some experience in turnkey management that can say, okay, here's the network. It's ready to go. We'll train you how to do it. 
And uh, so construction is, is one. And then finally, the third big one that we kept hearing about is now that we've got it, how do we run it? So uh, you may have different consultants, different industry partners for each of these, but these are really the three rubrics under which consultation can help you. So when we get into this final one, and that is operating the broadband network, hopefully for profit, for sustainability, and it covers all the things I talked about in that last slide, everything from sales to customer support to installing and so forth. And then normally we work out some sort of suitable sharing of revenues with the tribe and the operator. Obviously you gotta cover the costs of, of operating, but, it, but if you're doing it right, there will be net revenues to share. And uh, that can change over time, but that's something you'll wanna address certainly. And what, something that comes up a lot, I think, I don't know of a place in the United States that not ha is not having labor shortages. Every single uh, Native American tribe that we've spoken to in Oklahoma and the Muscogee Creek Nation is certainly one of them. We are begging them for labor. We want to have job fairs to where we can get tribal members who are interested in becoming installers, interested in working in the accounting department, any kind of area uh, of retail operation. We will take them, we'll train them, we'll hire them and uh, teach them how to help run one of these companies. Um, it is it is not simply an accommodation. We need the labor. So the more of your tribal members that are interested, the better for us. Make sure that's a part of what any kind of industry partner, retail operator does for you, that they're hiring your members, training them so that perhaps one day the tribe will run it entirely on its own, or at least mostly. So those are the three areas. And I think I'm almost done here. Well, I, I think I'll end with this. Oh, you know, Mike, I'll tell you, before we do that, would you comment briefly on what the Muscogee Creek Nation is hoping to have um, once this network is going to be built in your, what, 11 county area? Absolutely. So, you know, in all of our determinations, one of the most important things that we determined was that we own the physical infrastructure and assets. Um, that Having that network in place throughout our reservation gives us access to something that we own rather than having to access something that belongs to somebody else. We can avoid those costs. What we're hoping to have is a leverageable uh, connect, network connecting our entire reservation that is reliable, that meets the needs of our nation, but also helps us build for long-term growth as well, whether we do that through our own companies or whether we leverage that for passive income or however that works. Uh, we hope to have that strong network as a backbone for building growth in all areas throughout our reservation. So. Well, thank you, Michael. I, well, I'm going to end here. Um, I say make sure your industry partner has the right friends. Obviously, references are important. If you are a college football nut, that is a picture of Barry Switzer, the longtime Oklahoma University football coach. He is a friend of Atlink. He is our spokesperson, and uh, he happens to be, I believe, a member of the Cherokee tribe. He, of course, knew everybody. It seemed like every chief and every Native American tribe in Oklahoma, and as people were trying to establish whether we were bona fide helpers and industry partners. He gave us some credibility right on because they trusted his judgment. So uh, I use him as a, uh, we're very proud, of course, to have him as a, as a spokesperson. You go to our website, we have all sorts of Coach Switzer videos. So here's our uh, contact information. And that is my presentation. I invite questions for Micah and me and Sam, uh, if anyone has any. Um, Patrick, uh... Stephen actually did um, uh, send a very interesting question. If I applied for NTA grant and haven't heard back uh, for the approval, should I go ahead and submit application for the Reconnect program? Uh, are there any conflicts? Uh, are they complementary and so on? You know, that's a very good question. The, the fact of the matter is they are complementary. What you have to, and, th and that is, um, while you may only submit one application under each program, there is nothing that prevents you from making application under each program. What you have to be aware of is the ultimate service requirement changes. For example, under an NTIA grant, uh, you only have to do 25 and three service at the end of the day. That's 25 megabits per second down and three megabits per second up. But if you start applying, let's say, reconnect money to that, now it's suddenly got to be 100 and 100. Or if you want to do the, the ARPA money, that's also got to be 100 and 100, with some exceptions. So you have to be very careful about once you start taking money from one program, 
the ultimate requirement changes. And there are also changes in, in schedules. But to answer the question directly, there is nothing that prevents your applying and getting grant money under each of the programs. Hey, Pat, I'll add one thing to that. Um, you know, one of the challenges that we've had in navigating a lot of these funding sources is just how, um, how fluid the definition of broadband has been yeah. and what those requirements are and what the definition of minimum service is in a lot of these areas. Uh, there's also different mapping, uh, different data and criteria that they use for determining whether an area is served or unserved or underserved. Um, so the way that we've tried to approach that ambiguity in a lot of the uh, regulatory side is making sure that our applications are complementary to one another, but not um, they still maintain their mutual exclusivity so that if for some reason one doesn't get funded to the extent that we expected, it doesn't sink the other plan. And I really think the only way that we're able to accomplish that is by having a broader broadband plan for the entire nation together as we approach those applications separately. Um, the other thing about the NTIA round of funding, I, I did sit in on a webinar or a consultation this past week, and they're discussing how to approach that um, because, you know, there were a lot of tribes that were just applying for the fact of needing a plan and needing consulting and needing to know you know, what this would look like, but not going all the way through a full construction application. And then there are others that they submitted their entire application beyond the $50 million ask that was uh, limited to. And so they're, they're trying to decide if they're going to open that back up for a second round of applications or if they're going to continue considering the ones that were already in place and fully funding them. So uh, it's my understanding that's still a moving target at the moment as well. Um, but all that to say, you can address it as long as you have a large broadband plan that this fits into. Thank you, Micah. Interesting. And uh, Patrick, to be honest, it's, it's actually, it, it, you mentioned something very interesting about quality of broadband, because you know, different applications take different amount of uh, you know, bandwidth needed, but it always boils down to quality and consistency of the bandwidth delivered. Yep. And one of the things that you touched on the dime is mobile infrastructure, the broadband from carriers does not equal same wireless broadband that you deliver through your infrastructure as a fixed wireless user, as a fixed wireless uh, broadband, because it all boils down to quality and consistency. You know, on mobile networks, you do expect you know, this device to move. So your expectation of bandwidth is less uh, or more tolerable rather. You know, you do tolerate the buffering, you do understand the pixelations and so on. Um, at home, not anymore. You, you actually start complaining, hey, my internet is slow. And uh, end user at the end of the day, don't really understand the intricate technical details why there is a gap in bandwidth, right? And uh, yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. Alex, you know, it's, it's important. You know, I, I suppose unless you're in the industry, you, you wouldn't know that <clears throat> while you can get, um, you know, a broadband service from a T-Mobile or Verizon, the problem is <clears throat> they're using mobile phone technology to get it to you. And a cell tower for mobile phones and that technology has to be able to accommodate as many as, you know, hundreds of people at any given moment. And so it's terribly oversubscribed. And there are all sorts of data limitations that are going to apply to that kind of service because it has to accommodate who knows who's going to show up because it's mobile driving by that tower or an, an expecting service. If you have a fixed address, we know how many people we have to serve at any given time, and we have arranged to give them the proper broadband access speed to accommodate that address. Mobile carriers can't do that because they cannot know at any given moment how many people are suddenly going to be on that tower. What they do know is that tower has a limit, and they're going to start throttling everybody down to make sure. So it can be very, shall we say, unreliable at times. Whereas the Telrad service that comes to a fixed address is always reliable once established properly with the proper speed for that home. Thank, thank you, Patrick. Sam, can I uh, ask you uh, for your input to share about STS, the 
uh, you know, the kind of services, your 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 your, your industry you know, influence and, and knowledge and how it plays in this whole uh, you know, dynamics. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, my name is Sam Curtis. Um, I am the CEO of AtLink and uh, the owner of STS. A lot of uh, fixed wireless companies were born out of different industries. Um, my partners and I, we come out of the telecommunications industry at Atlink. My partners have 50 plus years as uh, running telephone companies, and I'm an engineer, and so we created Atlink in 2005. So we've always kept that engineering um, discipline in our, in our workplace. Uh, my partners are, are very talented when it comes to engineering, and we've built a staff of uh, professionals, Pat being one of the main ones as the COO of Atlink and in council for STS. He uh, has a tremendous background and knowledge, and we have multiple uh, senior <coughs> uh, management here at Atlink and STS that can help others. We saw a need at Atlink to partner with Native American tribes because we felt as though they had a lot of potential funding coming their way. And I felt that Atlink could provide that missing link as far as the operations. Because what we do at Atlink is we add customers and we close tickets. And that sounds simple, but as Pat pointed out, there are several elements into that operations. And, and we at Atlink pride ourselves on on being one of the best at doing that, so we offer that as a uh, as a as a as a partnership, as a service, as a solution to the Native American tribe in in Oklahoma or beyond. Uh, primarily, we're working in Oklahoma right now with folks like Micah. So, I hope that helped, Alex. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate it, and uh, I do have. Uh... We were almost taking an hour, seven minutes short. Um, I do have a couple of slides prepared just to talk a little bit about Telerad, uh, more as a um, kind of, hey, who we are and what do we do. So I'll give me one second. I'll bless the slides. Um, and it's very few. So Telerad, uh, we're... Uh, we're an industry partner. We've, uh, we're a seven-year-old company uh, been in a fixed wireless broadband space since the beginning. Um, we were pretty much the original company that introduced an LTE in the box. And what we mean, LTE is a, uh, is a complex system that's meant to run mobile world. I mean, it's, it's, it's no trivial task. Now, uh, fixed wireless access requires something else and doesn't need a lot of bells and whistles that mobile carriers ask. So what we did, we introduced a system that is specifically, a, we call it purpose built to run a fixed wireless world. So we're talking about from hardware perspective, doesn't matter where, where you deploy from deserts to, uh, to cold regions. Uh, it has a very specific set of software and algorithms, including the starvation protection, the fairness algorithms, to make sure that you allocate consistent and quality bandwidth on demand at all times as needed. Um, and it's very flexible and agile platform. You can, uh, you know, one base station can it can have six different topologies. So when you're talking about a network or uh, that, it, you know, depending on, you, know, you might have cells with 50 users, you might have cells with only 10 users, right? And in our case, it's one base station that, or one enode B that can serve variety of scenarios. So you have to worry about less of the um, spare parts, easier ordering, and, uh, and engineers don't need to learn different hardware components. So obviously, uh, multiple hardware components. Um, so obviously applications, as you can imagine, 
spread anything from remote learning education, the residential broadband into smart agriculture. Uh, the, the IoT world today, Internet of Things world today becoming very, very popular. Uh, people want to connect. Uh, they want to know, um, uh, they want to know uh, uh, <laughs> what's happening, the security, the who's at the door, how many times cat or dog went, you know, to, uh, or cat rather went to a litter. So all those things suddenly become important in our world, in our today's world. Uh, telehealth is another big component, moreover, with COVID. It exposed um, some of those uh, issues with, hey, doctor's availability, distance. How can you overcome that? And, and teleworld um, gives you that ability. Um, uh, so uh, in, a not, in a nutshell, few bullet points, why Telred, our value proposition. And uh, it's really all about hybrid network and multi-band approach. Uh, it's not one product, it's multiple products. We do cover, as Patrick mentioned earlier, the 2.5, the EBS DRS frequency band. Um, uh, we have CBRS uh, and uh, we're actually been with CBRS industry since the beginning. Um, know a thing or two about that and uh, we'll, be, we'll gladly share our experience. We have phenomenal software that runs CBRS network. Uh, we have introduced private LTE plus uh, that is a very, by definition, all of our networks are private LTE networks. You know, we, if a customer owns infrastructure end to end and have control over traffic security policies, um, uh, service level agreements, uh, it's your private network. Uh, and Micah mentioned something very important and the, you, you want to own the infrastructure, right? So, so by definition, it's a private LTE network, but what we offer is the extension outside the traditional footprint. What happens if you go outside your footprint? And here we offer additional capability as well as support for a variety of mobile devices, um, IoT devices, uh, as I call it, smart dumpster application where you can uh, you can attach an LTE modem to pretty much anything from water meter to, to gas, to electric, to anything. Um, and a lot of it boils down to business case. And uh, we, uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned, LTE is a, is a complex system and uh, it has to make financial sense to run it, not just deploy it, but to run it. Since it does require training, it does require different caliber of people uh, and education. So our contact information uh, is, uh, is below. We are, uh, you know, we're here to answer any questions uh, you guys might have. Um, and uh, I would like to pass the microphone over back to, to the group, see if- uh, Alex, if, if I could make one closing comment. Um, the, the importance of having an equipment supplier like Telrad that stands behind their product, that has technical uh, expertise available to you uh, by phone, by email. We've even had a personal visit. When we have questions come up, Telrad is Johnny on the spot with help. It's not just great equipment. It's great people and a great organization. Um, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't paid to say that, but I am moved to say it from personal experience. Thank you for the good work you do and the help you provide to us. Thank, thank you, Pat. I do appreciate it. So it's very humbling, and uh, you know you can you can you can have best technology, but Telerad has, and I can bet one of the best and most professional, amazing people as a team, and uh, and that's really in today's world that's who makes the difference. Uh, and to it's not just to make the gear. But really to support every, uh, uh, and that's uh, I do appreciate the comment. Thank you. Right. Um, oh, yeah. Go I'm ahead. sorry. Was there one last comment? No. No. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much uh, for the presentation. There was a lot of information. I know I had a couple of people asking in the chat um, about um, when the 
uh, recording will be available and it will go out tomorrow afternoon. We do have a quick poll. If you please uh, go ahead and take that before we um, before we sign off here. A lot of the keywords I heard today, sustainability, ownership, um, definitely some great things and great stuff in this presentation to go back and share with your with your team. Uh, if anybody has any questions or would like to get in touch with Telrad or in any of the speakers today and you don't remember the email, just make sure to connect with us here at Travel Hub and we will make sure to get you connected to the right folks. All right, and with that, anything else um, from the group here before we end? All right, well, I'm gonna end our poll here and end the webinar and everybody have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.